Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pediatric Grand Rounds this morning. Um, we have an excellent panel, which is presenting this morning. Uh, so I'm going to keep the introductions very brief. Uh, leading away today is Dr. Rachel Cole, who is a sports medicine physician um, with HBH Medical Group um, and has a lot of interest in injury prevention. Um, we also have Lisa Dow, who is the Injury Prevention Coordinator at Kapiolani Medical Center. And uh, she has uh, worked as a nurse here in our system for over 32 years. Um, following that, we have a new individual who has come into the community, Dr. Jennifer Grad, uh, who is a pediatric emergency medicine attending physician at Kapiolani. Uh, and has a lot of uh, interest and passion for injury prevention uh, with her work done in New York City for prevention of firearm injuries. Uh, following that, we have um, Jessamine Tom Horner, uh, who uh, is uh, the director of the um, uh, Oahu Coalition Safety Coalition, uh, Hawaii Water Safety Coalition, um, sharing some of uh, what is being done here and uh, bringing up the final part of the panel is Dr. Patricia Morgan, uh, who is um, uh, based at Kapiolani. She is a child uh, advocacy and protection center director here at Kapiolani. Uh, and they are talking about a very important topic today and um, so without any further ado, I'll have Dr. Rachel Cole take it away. All right, good morning. Thank you for attending Grand Rounds today. My name is Rachel Cole, and I'm a pediatric sports medicine specialist here at Kapiolani Bone and Joint and a physician champion for water safety. Uh, my colleagues and I are here from the Hawaii Water Safety Coalition to share with you some information about drowning prevention and water safety. Uh, we have no um, financial or commercial disclosures, but we did want to give a warning that some of the topics we're discussing today uh, may be deeply personal or heavily emotional for some of you in the audience. Um, we did also want to provide some acknowledgments for those who helped us get to the podium today, um, specifically uh, Daniel Galanis from the Hawaii Department of Health, um, as well as Sarah Fairchild from Outrigger Duke Kahanamoku Foundation, Hawaii Lifeguard Association, Hawaii Water Safety Coalition members, Doris Duke Foundation, and No More Under and Drowning in Silence. Our objectives today are to emphasize that drowning is the leading cause of death for children in Hawaii, ages one to 15 years, the leading cause of death. And we also wanna go over um, the risk factors related to drowning, as well as help you understand the pathophysiology related to drowning. And lastly, our goal is to help us all implement prevention plans, techniques, and education tools to reduce drowning risk and improve water safety. So before I begin, I want to just start with some drowning definitions. So what is drowning? The CDC defines drowning as the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in liquid. There are three types of drowning victims. The first type is a fatal drowning victim. A fatal, dr fatal drowning victim is someone whose drowning event results in their death. There are two other types under the category of non-fatal. There's non-fatal drowning victims who have long lasting health problems related to their drowning event, either cognitive or physical forms of disabilities. And that typically makes up about 20% of drowning victims. The other category is non-fatal drowning victims who have no health complications related to their drowning event. For every child under the age of 18 who dies from drowning, another seven will receive emergency department care for non-fatal drowning. And nearly 40% of drownings treated in the emergency department require hospitalization or transfer for further care compared with 10% for all other categories of unintentional injury. Shazik Tsunoda, who is a journalist and a filmmaker, lost her son, Yori, who's pictured here, when he was three years old in a backyard swimming pool drowning accident. I'm gonna share with you now Yori's story. 
He was a vivacious and super energetic three-year-old. I feel like every mother says that their child is special, but Yori was super special. I think what I want people to know is how instant things can change, how instant your life can change. <laughs> It was a regular day, hanging out with friends, playing at the pool, and Yori seemed happy enough playing on the side of the pool. Um, and honestly, I picked up the life vest. I picked up the life vest and I looked over Adults were in the pool, kids were in the pool. He was having fun on the side and it seemed okay. And when I tell you it was an instant, there was no yelling, there was no screaming, there was no splashing, there was silence. And I literally said, where's Yori? So I remember pulling up and there had already been one unit on scene. We get there, we walk through the back, um, and then we see engine five and they're um, in progress of CPR. At that moment, all I remember thinking is, you know, um, whatever I can do to help. I do feel fortunate. The first responders were there very quickly and they were able to resuscitate Yori, and we did get him to a hospital, but it was too late. So a year after Yori's death, Shazik founded the nonprofit organization for drowning and awareness called No More Under, and she produced a film documentary about Yori's accident and about water safety called Drowning in Silence. The next video clip I want to show you is from Drowning in Silence, and it highlights the impact that drowning has on people like us, pediatricians. He was a vivacious and super energetic. When I saw Yuri, um, I couldn't believe how peaceful he looked. Um, even with all these tubes, he looked really peaceful. And I just think about Yuri and how active and playful he was every time I saw him in clinic. And I couldn't put the two together. It was such a disconnect. I do remember a sense of hopelessness and frustration, realizing that at this point in time, given what we know about brains and time Without oxygen, there was just little we could do. Many of us chose pediatrics because we like to deal with kids who have a huge future ahead of them. So when Yori died, it was really hard for me as a pediatrician. In our 10 to 15 minutes that we have once a year, we have to examine the child, talk about their growth, behavior issues, and talk about safety prevention. Water safety is in our guidelines, but honestly, we have so many other things that parents want our counsel on. Sometimes safety prevention falls to the wayside. And so I have shared Yori's story with my colleagues because sharing that story can help other pediatricians understand what's most important when we counsel parents. I have now revised a lot of my counseling to really counsel my patients on drowning prevention. I hate that it took Yuri's passing to get to that, but I know that his death will also never be forgotten because it's changed the way that I practice medicine.
So it's heavy and hard things. Uh, crying is okay. So this poster makes a strong statement. Um, we lose the equivalent of 11 school buses of children each year to drowning. Oh, that's a lot, 11 school buses. And did you know that nationally drowning is the leading cause of accidental death in children ages one through four? I'm gonna take you now through some of these statistics both nationally and in Hawaii to give you an understanding of how prevalent drowning is. So in the United States, Hawaii ranks second only to Alaska in drowning fatalities. Male children make up a larger proportion of fatal drownings than female children, contributing about 75 to 80% of cases. In America, more children ages one through four die from drowning than any other cause of death. This age group is at particular risk of fatal drowning when you think about it, because at this age, they're mobile, they're curious, they can wander to a body of water, but yet they're at an age where they're not typically swimming competent. Drowning is also the leading cause of death in children ages one through 15 in Hawaii, the leading cause of death, more so than malignant neoplasm, suicide, motor vehicle accidents. It's also the leading cause of death in our visitors, our tourists contributing nearly 50% of all fatal injuries in non-residents here in Hawaii. Both Hawaii's locals and our visitors face drowning risks. When we look at fatal drownings in Hawaii by age group, as this table shows us, Hawaii residents make up 96% of fatal drownings in victims ages zero to 17. Whereas if we look at the next age category, 18 and older, tourists make up the majority at 54%. This table shows us fatal drownings in Hawaii by race and ethnicity with native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders making up a disproportionate number of cases. Nationally, it's very similar with black Alaska native, American Indian, native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders having rates two to three times higher than whites when it comes to fatal drownings. Social determinants of health may affect one's ability to stay safe around water. And this may be rooted in historical segregation or inequities and crimes against certain populations. For example, when we think of things like lack of transportation or access to safe places to swim or to learn to swim, uh, lack of access to swimming lessons, perhaps societal neglect of neighborhoods, um, lack of resources, defense in bodies of water, such as containment reservoirs or drainage ditches. And for some, such as in the American uh, African-American communities um, and Shazik touches on this in her film as well. Fear of drowning can serve now as a cultural norm that may keep some from learning to swim. And this may keep them from having competent swimming role models. I don't know if you know this, but that if your parents don't know how to swim, you have an 87% chance of not knowing how to swim yourself. When we talk about swimming competency here in our state, our numbers are very poor. Less than 2% of Hawaii second graders have the basic skills to avoid or recover from a dangerous aquatic situation. So what are those skills? You need to be able to step or jump into the water, get in over your head, return to the surface and float or tread water for one minute, turn around in a full circle and find an exit, swim 25 yards without stopping, and then be able to exit that body of water. And if it's a pool, exit without using a ladder. And yet when we look at a survey of second graders done by the Hawaii Aquatics Foundation from 2018 to 2019, 69% of the students were unable to swim for 25 yards, 87% couldn't tread water for 60 seconds, and 88% were unable to float for 30 seconds. And yet parents overestimate, overestimate their ability of their children and they underestimate the risk their children are at for drowning. National Safe Kids did a survey and looked at 55%, uh, found that 55% of parents stated they did not worry very much or at all about their child drowning. And yet, if you look at the numbers, the typical lifeguard to swimmer ratio in public aquatic areas is one lifeguard to 25 swimmers. Drowning can happen to anyone, anywhere. There is water, even in as little as one to two inches of water, even in as little as 30 seconds. You might be listening to this and thinking, I'm not a swimmer, my family's not a swimmer, but let me ask you this, 
Do you have a bathtub? Do you have a working toilet? Then drowning can happen in your home too. This slideshow shows national level data. It's looking at, open, uh, looking at the different environments where drownings occur. And you can see that open water and swimming pools make up the vast majority, nearly 80% of drowning deaths. Typically, when we think about open water, we think about teenagers, lakes, ponds, oceans, um, and specifically males, whereas uh, we think about children and toddlers um, having fatal drowning accidents in swimming pools, and in bathtubs and toilets, we think about infants and toddlers. Hawaii's children also tend to die similar to what those national numbers show us, which is mostly in pools or in the ocean. However, when we look at our adult category, fatal deaths in, uh, from drowning in Hawaii tend to occur mostly in males, mostly in tourists, and mostly in the ocean. So I will be showing you another video here um, that emphasizes that uh, some of the points that Shazik makes in some of her uh, films. Drowning doesn't look like the movies. Um, it's quiet. It's like I lost, I might've lost the mic here. I don't know. Um, there's no flailing of the arms. Um, typically there's, uh, it's quick, less than 60 seconds. If you're a water watcher, you're watching for children who are swimming. You wanna watch in particular for kids who jump in and don't come back up to the surface. You also wanna watch for kids who are wearing a flotation device and there's no parent around. Um, that's something that we don't recommend having a child unsupervised uh, with a flotation device um, as again, there should be contact by a parent at all time. You also want to listen, listen for quiet because normally when kids play, they're noisy in the water, but if there's silence, that should be a warning sign. Someone drowning can't yell for help because they're spending their energy trying to breathe. And lastly, you wanna look for somebody who's vertical in the water. They're, they may be looking like they're climbing a ladder. They're not learning to doggy paddle, they're drowning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jennifer Gred, and I'm going to talk about, we're going to transition and talk about the pathophysiology of drowning. So, what happens when a person drowns? Submersion leads to aspiration and pulmonary injury, which then leads to multi organ hypoxia, with struggling leading to hypoxia sooner. A child will lose consciousness two minutes after submersion, with irreversible brain damage occurring within four to six minutes. On a systems based level, surfactant washout leads to alveolar capillary membrane damage, atelectasis, pulmonary edema, vasoconstriction, and bronchospasm, similar to ARDS. Hypoxia leads to neuro neuronal injury and cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure. And in terms of cardiovascular arrhythmias can be due to hypoxia and hypothermia. Arrest can occur from tachycardia leading to bradycardia leading to PEA and then as systole. Ventricular arrhythmias are rare. Sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, 
Atrial fibrillation with a pulse don't require treatment other than ventilation and rewarming. And metabolic and respiratory acidosis can occur with normal electrolytes typically as the amount of fluid aspirated or ingested is insufficient to result in electrolyte abnormalities. The presence of chlorine doesn't influence this clinical course and therefore the idea of drowning between salt and fresh water, there's actually not a difference there. And then acute tubular necrosis can occur due to hypoxia and hemoglobin myoglobin deposition. So what does pre-hospital care look like and what can you do as a bystander or if a friend or family member needs help? Our main management goal is to prevent further anoxic brain injury and damage by giving adequate ventilation. So ventilatory support ASAP even prior to chest compression. So typically I know a long time ago we were learning CAB, but now it's ABC. So airway, breathing, circulation, that's our new order. Um, that may look like mouth to mouth, rescue breaths, high flow O2 for spontaneously breathe, breathing patients, bag valve mask ventilation or intubation for the neck patient. Then consider chest compressions, passive rewarming. So remove clothing, apply blankets. Was there trauma? Think about C-spine immobilization. Um, and then the American Heart Association does not recommend routine use of abdominal thrust or Heimlich maneuver for drowning victims anymore. So emergency department, now what's our care look like there? Who do we intubate? The apneic patient, the patient whose oxygen saturation is 90% despite O2, and then the patient whose PCO2 is greater than 50. Think about positive pressure for non-compliant lungs. Think about fluids, but you wanna balance shock with avoiding worsening pulmonary edema. Of note, uh, the hypothermic patient, there's vasoconstriction, results in a shift of fluids centrally. You want to reduce cerebral hypoxia and maintain perfusion, so elevate the head of the bed 30 degrees, seizure control, and maintain euglycemia for patients. Monitor for dysarrhythmia. So a cold myocardium can lead to um, increased susceptibility to ventricular arrhythmias that may be refractory to treatment. Management includes, again, regressive rewarming techniques and only a single attempt at antiarrhythmics in these cases. There's a theorized benefit of hypothermia due to rapid decrease in basal metabolic rate and O2 consumption. Current guidelines recommend that resuscitation efforts be continued into a temperature of 32 to 35 Celsius, which is 90 to 95 Fahrenheit, is achieved. Monitor core temperature with esophageal or rectal probe temperatures. And then think about active and passive rewarming. So warm blankets, heating pads, radiant heaters, forced warm air, active rewarming, um, internally being humidified oxygen via endotracheal tube, if that's in place, or heated irrigation of pleural or peritoneal cavities. Um, and then ECMO is a consideration as well. What factors are associated with poor outcomes? Uh, most predictive is submersion time greater than five minutes, time to effective BLS greater than 10 minutes, resuscitation efforts greater than 25 minutes, GCS less than five, persistent apnea in the ED, or pH of less than 7.1 at presentation. So the American Journal of Emergency Medicine put out an article, who can we discharge safely from the emergency department? So children who present to the ED with a GCS of equal to or greater than 13 and have normal physical exam and respiratory effort and a room air oxygen saturation greater than 95% at four to six hours after ED presentation can be safely discharged home. And please remember the majority of children who survive without neurological consequences are discovered within two minutes of submersion. And then most children who die are found after 10 minutes. The total combined economic cost of pediatric and adult drowning is estimated at 53 billion annually. The economic costs of fatal and non-fatal drownings among children was estimated to be 16.92 billion in 2020, with fatal drownings accounting for 94% of total costs at 15 billion with the remaining costs being accounted for by ED visits and hospitalizations. Drowning, of course, has a far greater impact than purely financial cost. And it is an honor for me to be able to introduce Jessamy Town Horner, who has so kindly joined us today to share her story and the circle of impact it has had. Hi, thank you for including me today in this important talk. 
I'm here to represent the newly formed Hawaii Water Safety Coalition and also as someone who personally understands drowning's impact. And I'm just gonna play a slideshow here. I want to start by acknowledging the power of the data that we have seen today and its directive to prioritize drowning prevention in Hawaii. Data is also a strange thing because it is by definition anonymous. Great pains are taken to maintain privacy in these data sets, but I'm here to remind us that within excuse me, and I probably will cry, and that's okay, I know. Within each data point is a story, a person, a whole universe. Whenever I see the drowning data for 2016, I feel it at the deepest level. My husband, Mark, and my daughter, Mina, will forever be part of these numbers. And I wanted to share what that really means within a, fa a family and also within the greater community. On July 16, 2016, Mark decided to take our three daughters to the Makapu Tide Pools. The Tide Pools are located below the Makapu Lookout and are accessed by a steep turnoff from the Lighthouse Road. It is very popular, despite the rugged hike down and its precarious location on the edge of the vast Ka'ibi Channel. Mark observed the conditions on the hike down with the waves breaking below the tide shelf. But what he did not know this was that there was a large storm many miles offshore. There was no closure or conditions-based warning signs. He and the girls were enjoying the inner tide pools closest to the trail, along with a few other people. But when the tide shifted, it brought in a massive storm set that washed over the entire area, taking Mina into the open ocean and Mark went in after her. My two older daughters were pulled out of the tide pools between waves by another visitor. The lifeguards had to launch jet skis from Sandy's to rescue them, and they were taken to separate hospitals. Mina was brought here to Kapiolani. When I received a call that something had happened, I arrived and was told that neither of them had made it, despite every effort. There's nothing that can prepare you for that kind of news. They were so full of life and then they were gone. No chance for goodbyes right in the middle of their stories. It's still hard to grasp. My two other daughters, now 20 and 16, have to wake up without their dad and youngest sister every single day. Mark's and Mina's friends still reach out with remembrances. The three of us have made great strides over the years to build a new life together, but it continues to be defined by that day. After the accident, I reached out to the lifeguards who were there and met with them. They shared how deeply they were affected. They even took jet skis to the tide pools where they sprinkled flowers and sent us the video. They installed a rescue tube all on their own. I also heard about the impact on the police and firemen and also the EMS staff and doctors who tried their best to revive them. I heard from people that witnessed the accident, whole families who were hiking up to the lighthouse at that time. There was a shared wish that there were more warnings, that the jet skis were closer, that Mark had a better understanding of the risks of that location and long response times. I've run through this scenario hundreds of times to see if there's a way I could somehow magically change it, but I can't. While I can't change what happened, I, like many other bereaved families, like Shazik, who I have had the opportunity to meet, have channeled my efforts into drowning prevention. The effort needed for prevention is minuscule compared to the devastating impact of one loss, a single data point. In assessing the drowning prevention efforts in Hawaii, I have found that there were many wonderful people and organizations working in specific areas, outreach, education, lifeguarding, advocacy, but that there was no collective effort to build a comprehensive statewide solution. In response to this need, the Outrigger Duke Kahanamoku Foundation and the Hawaiian Lifeguard Association held a leadership conference this summer and the Hawaii Water Safety Coalition out of it with several volunteer working groups. 
the coalition recently found a home within the Keiki Injury Prevention Coalition here at Kapiolani. One of the goals of the coalition is to learn from other states' efforts and to align with the new U.S. National Water Safety Action Plan. But it is also specific to Hawaii and built on the concept of Malama Kekahi i Kekahi, that here in our island community, we take care of each other. On my visit to the Makapu tide pools on the first year anniversary of the accident, I saw tiny white and purple flowers on a vine that hugged the rocky trail. Mina loved tiny cute things and the image stayed with me. I asked around and learned that the name of the plant is Pau Ohiiaka and that it has a special mo'olelo. When Peli went out surfing one day, she left her little sister Hiyaka sleeping on the beach and the vines grew up and around her as a gentle blanket to protect her from the sun. Pau means the wrap or skirt of Hiyaka. This tender mo'olelo was such a gift for me to hold in my heart and this spirit of protection is one that I carry forward in my work and I invite all of you to do so as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm Lisa Dow. I'm a nurse here at Kapiolani and uh, the Injury Prevention Coordinator. It's always difficult to follow, Jesse, because it's so impactful of what my job is about. So I'm gonna to talk to you about injury prevention and I'm gonna start off with Keiki Injury Prevention Coalition. Um, and we also are known as KIPSI and it is a community-based um, program with many organizations, individuals and agencies all dedicated to doing the same thing of our mission, uh, which is to reduce childhood injuries. Um, KIPSI was established by Department of Health back in 1991, and it, uh, I thought it was 91, I put 90 up there, um, and it became a nonprofit in 95. Uh, we have quarterly meetings. There are no employees with KIPSI, but we do have a board, and we have a website. The, there is a QR code there, and we encourage you and your families to go onto our website and get more information, some downloadable information as well, and some of our activities in the community. Uh, this is the board. Um, got our president, Speedy Bailey, uh, from AMR, Director of Operations, some familiar faces, Susie LaFontaine, retired rehab um, director for Kapiolani Medical Center, a, a really probably uh, familiar face with Ken, uh, Dr. Ken Sarawatari, retired physician, pediatrician, and he's our treasurer. Um, Mark Hayward, um, pastor over at Halal uh, Church, and then, um, Carrie Samita, who is the Director of Rehab Services here at Kapiolani, and she's also my boss. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, there are no employees with um, KIPSI, but there are grant coordinators. Um, so KIPSI gets funding from oftentimes from state and federal funds, and then they contract. So Karen Tessier is a, um, a professor over at UH Manoa School of Nursing. She oversees all the car seat program for Oahu. So all the various sites such as one of them would be like Wainai Coast and here at Kapiolani. Um, myself, I do all the other injury prevention areas. And then Jesse Horner is now our newest member of KIPSI coordinator and she is the um, program coordinator for Hawaii Water Safety Coalition, which will now be housed and hosted by Kipsi. At Kapiolani Medical Center, we have an injury prevention program. It started back in like 2014, but really injury prevention started way before that with our car seat program. Um, for trauma services, we are a part of trauma services, very important part. Um, lead agency for Safe Kids Hawaii, which is one of 407 agencies and state offices across the United States, um, one of 407. And where Safe Kids Worldwide is in 47 states. We do Kapiolani host KIPSI as well as Safe Kids Hawaii and it's basically hosted in my office. Um, and what we do is it's, it's about awareness, getting education out there, doing some advocacy work and we do um, participate in some amount of uh, research. 
And these are some of our programs here at Kapi'olani. Again, we partner with Kipsi and Safe Kids Hawaii, so like our car seat program, Cribs, um, Purple Crime, and we do inpatient, outpatient, and community services. Um, and so prevention does matter. So some of you may see this person as being somebody familiar uh, for those, especially I guess the young ones, um, may think this is Colonel Sanders and it is not. This is Dr. C. Ever Coop. He was a, a very um, progressive, very famous pediatrician, pediatric surgeon back in the day. And he served as a surgeon general back in the eighties. And he was the founding chairman of Safe Kids uh, and a, a champion for children and, and fa um, families. And he famously said once, and I'm gonna quote it, that if a disease were killing kids at the rate that injuries are, the public would be outraged and demand that the killer be stopped. We are still outraged because of those numbers that we see. 88% of the childhood drownings under the age of 14 occur while under adult supervision, really it's lack of adult supervision. And 85% of the drowning events are preventable, okay? So when we go to um, Dr. Pat Morgan and I, uh, our team members on child death review here in Oahu, and when we review cases, particularly with drowning, this is a consistent thing that we see with adult lack of adult supervision being up higher there, and then these other areas that um, lead to uh, potential drowning or fatal or non-fatal drowning, but surely something that we need to address. So the drowning prevention plans, the United States Water Safety Action Plan, it's a 10 year um, plan of action. It started last year. It was initiated by the Water Safety USA with panel members and experts in the field of drowning prevention and water safety. And in fact, um, we had people here in Hawaii that were on the blue panel, uh, blue ribbon panels such as um, uh, Bridget Velasco. And there are a lot of watermen people, water women people in the state of Hawaii that are doing great work and we wanna continue that work. And we're gonna use the plan to help guide us. So the United States Water Safety Action Plan is six key areas. There are 99 re recommendations within these six key areas. I am not gonna go through them. Um, but these are the six key areas, and I'm going to ask Dr. Pat Morgan to come up and just kind of highlight some of these areas. Good morning. I'm Dr. Pat Morgan. Again, I have to say thank you to Jessamy for sharing her very impactful um, story with us. It brings home the message of what we're trying to convey today, which is really about prevention. And that's really what piqued my interest uh, in the work that I do in, in, in pediatrics. So we'll start with talking about the five layers of protection. First, fences and alarms. Pools and spas should be fenced, ideally with four-sided fencing, and there should be the use of fence alarms or other safety alarms that's highly recommended. The second layer of protection, with, which we've mentioned a few times now, is supervision. But what's really important about that supervision is that it should provide close and constant attention to children who are in or near water. The third layer of protection is water competency. As Dr. Cole showed us, we are sadly not doing well with water competency in many of our keiki here. But it's really important for us to learn and instruct children on swimming, water safety and risk assessments, and understanding and recognizing the limits when they are near water. The fourth layer of protection, life jackets. Life jackets for children, inexperienced swimmers, those who are in open water or boating, they should be wearing life jackets that are properly sized. And then fifth, emergency preparation plan or emergency action plan. It is important that we learn and practice these emergency action plans, such as calling 911, learning CPR, and using AEDs when necessary. So how do we improve survival as part of that emergency action plan? Well, we've learned that sometimes silence is key and recognizing that someone is in trouble when there might be silence, or if they're in trouble and obviously visibly in trouble, yelling for help. Rescue and remove the person 
but it's really important to try to remember to not place yourself in danger. There's something I'll talk about in a moment called throw and don't go. So that's really important that you wanna keep yourself safe while trying to help others. Call for help, call for EMS. And if you're alone, you're gonna give two minutes of rescue care and then call EMS. Begin rescue breathing, as Dr. Grad mentioned. We wanna give those two rescue breaths and try to provide ventilatory support. And then lastly, using an AED, if available, and transferring care for advanced life support. So here you'll see on the side of the pool, the um, ventilation and ventilatory support, and then to the right of the slide, the use of the AED. It's important to use proper life-size jackets. And it's also important to recognize that a drowning victim will oftentimes panic. And when a rescuer tries to help them, they will often use that rescuer and pull them down under with them. So one of the areas of prevention and assistance are rescue tubes. And so rescue tubes serve as personal flotation devices and they reduce the risk by being given to that distressed swimmer. So by giving that distressed swimmer a buoyant object, hopefully that helps them keep their head above water. The person who's trying to rescue does not place themselves at harm and you're able to hopefully get to safety. There's been a wonderful and successful um, effort on our neighbor island, um, one of the neighbor islands on Kauai, where they've implemented rescue tubes. It started in 2009, and they are funded and maintained by the Rotary Clubs there. And there are so far to date over 240 rescue tubes on the island, and they have been more than 200 recorded saves. This is also being deployed in other counties, such as Maui, um, uh, the Big Island, and it's also being spread nationwide to states like North Carolina, South Dakota, Florida, and soon will be in California as well. So we'll talk a little bit about su supervision because that really is so important. And as we think about supervision, there are three Cs, close, constant, capable. What is important to recognize is that not only does the adult have to be close, they have to be constantly there and constantly watching that child. And they have to be capable. We need our adults who are supervising children to be competent swimmers. But there's one more C and that's contact. If you have young children, infants, toddlers who are not yet competent swimmers, you have to directly be in contact with them relying on flotation devices, boogie boards, uh, things of that nature are not really adequate. So this is a water watcher card and we do have some on the table here in the front. Uh, this is used by someone who is a capable and competent swimmer and they are the designated adult to watch the children who are in or near the water. And essentially that water watcher is agreeing to keep their eyes on the children at all times. They are agreeing to avoid all distractions and they agree that they will not leave that swimming area without handing over that responsibility to another designated adult swimmer who is very capable and competent. As the adult who's supervising children who are in or near water, it is essential to make sure that you are not distracted. You shouldn't be on your cell phone, you should avoid reading, drinking alcohol, holding conversations. You really, your focus needs to be on the child or the children in the water. Looking directly at them so that you're able to assist as needed if there's anyone who's in trouble or needs help. As part of drowning prevention, we must also recognize water hazards. There are many bodies of water or other potential bodies of water like drainage ditches that are empty until they aren't. Flash floods can occur in what seems like calm streams, which can become torrential rivers on hiking trails. And children can wander off into water features and may perhaps be going to get a ball or retrieve a toy and fall in and may not be able to climb out. Well, just like click it or ticket or back to sleep, public education is key. And so here are two examples of some public education related to water safety. American Red Cross has a campaign called Reach or Throw 
don't go. And the message in that is for our children, our youth, to understand that even though they want to help someone, it may not be safe for them to do so, to jump in to try to save that person. So what they should do is try to reach for an object that they can then provide to the person that they can reach and try to uh, have them come to safety. And here locally, you'll see uh, another prevention campaign that is um, for education. It's Maka'ala Bay, which is from Nakamakai, and it's based in Pokai Bay. And they offer free clinics on the island. Uh, they talk about um, ocean safety, stewardship, and they also have lots of free videos and even coloring books to download. The National Drowning Prevention Alliance is another great resource. There are toolkits that anyone can use. And so here are some water safety handouts. They're based on age from infancy to our toddlers and preschool, school age up to teenagers. There's also information about the how to find the proper swim program for your child. And as a part of a public education, Again, what Dr. Cole had mentioned is that drowning can happen in any body of water, even in a bathtub. So this is just another way to have our community much more aware of the safety risk. And I'll leave this up for just a brief moment. This is the QR code for, um, to access the handouts that I just described. There are also information on the table in the front of the room. According to the International Safe Water Safety Foundation, that organization strives to make a planet that's 70% water, 100% water safe. The World Health Organization has stated that drowning is the third leading cause of death worldwide that's unintentional. And so May 15th is International Water Safety Day. It is a day where we try to raise global awareness as it relates to water safety. And so do your part, be water smart. This is a partnership with American Red Cross as well so that you can learn and be more active in your community. How else can you help? How can you get involved? And why is this message important? Why did we feel like we needed to do this today? Because very honestly, pediatricians, uh, physicians and other healthcare providers, we have a direct prevention connection to our patients and to our families. And in order for us to do our job properly, we need to understand the problem so that we can provide the proper outreach, raise awareness and educate all of our uh, community. How else can you help? You can advocate for in-school swim competency lessons. Actually, in the current legislative session, there's a bill to, um, offer free competency and in swimming instruction in all of our public schools here. So if you want to help, you can contact your local lawmaker and ad help advocate for this to happen in our schools. You can join an organization such as Water Hawaii Water Safety Coalition. You can support our wonderful lifeguards through the Hawaii Lifeguard Association. You can find other ways by joining public outreach, outreach campaigns for water safety and campaign for policy change. And as I mentioned, continue to learn about this topic, starting with watching Drowning in Silence by Chesik Sonoto, which are available on these platforms. How else can you help? On a personal level, people are going to come to visit us here, but they may not be uh, aware of the drowning risk. So here are some things that you can share with your family and friends who come to visit recognizing that tourists are, again, leading victims in drowning deaths here. Knowing the conditions, assessing for safety and water safety before you go. Try your best to go to beaches where there are lifeguards and go during those lifeguarded hours. Look for rescue tubes as well. You're going to read and follow posted signs and warnings and make sure your guests understand the importance of that. Stress to our keiki that they have to ask a grown up first before they go into water. And that adult supervision, keeping eyes on children and being in direct contact with those who are not experienced swimmers, that's so important and must happen at all times. 
bring a proper size life jacket or personal flotation devices, and knowing your limits, all very important for us to make sure that we stress also to not swim alone. So in closing, it's important for us to understand that drowning is taking lives, not only here with our Keiki, visitors who come to our island as well, but we can help. We can make sure that we raise awareness and that we advocate for policy change and that we make sure that adults need to supervise and properly watch children as they are in the water. Swimming competency really does matter. Again, reminding you that we have the opportunity to make a difference in our legislative session in promoting this bill. But lastly, drowning is preventable. We just have to take the action and you can make a difference. I want to thank my co-presenters and this is all of our contact information. These are our references. And I'll leave this up for a moment. These are the QR codes to Hawaii Water Safety Coalition, the public resource drive, which has lots of great resources and to the newsletter, please sign up today. And with that, mahalo for your attention and we are available for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Morgan, yeah. to close out uh, this presentation. And uh, um, I guess uh, we will get started. So being the moderator, I get to ask the first question. And um, really, from the perspective of our community, um, can anyone from your group actually comment on the role the Department of Education plays on educating in the elementary schools as far as water safety for our uh, school children. Thank you for that question. Um, just last session, we had a bill introduced to fund uh, aquatic competency lessons in the public schools. It didn't pass last session, but we're reintroducing it now. Um, it would fund qualified nonprofits that could provide these services. There was a organization, Hawaii Aquatics Foundation, that was successfully offering them on Oahu and several other islands. And um, we hope that this bill will be successful this session. We did um, add in that we hope that there would be a position within the DOE funded to also facilitate that. So again, having public lessons in the public schools is critical because we found that most families cannot afford after school swim lessons. So this is the only scalable, equitable way to provide this for our children. Certainly being in Hawaii, that's something we can do. It's, it's part of our lifestyle here. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, why don't you see if there is a question in the auditorium and take that. So um, thank you. Uh, as you know, the, the, the relationship between education and behavior is rather thin. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, click it and ticket worked, but it worked because of the ticket. And so I'm wondering what we're doing in the way of something like requiring licensing of home pools so that you have to have your pool licensed and therefore it has to have some of those primary level um, um, passive preventions attached to them in order to be allowed to have a pool at your home um, or in your apartment building? That's a great question. Um, I believe that that is the case in other states and it's not the case in Hawaii. And that's certainly something as a coalition that we can look into. So being the end of one on Zoom, I'm going to take the second question for you folks. Um, I know when Dr. Morgan was talking about um, the safety tubes, she was very careful in not mentioning Oahu. So can I ask the status of these on Oahu, please? 
Yes. So um, there was just an article in the news that a bunch of rescue tubes were um, implemented yesterday or this weekend, I believe. Um, the Lions Club here is very active in that role. I've personally worked with um, one of the folks who volunteers to install them and they're fantastic. So I think it's just taken time to convince leadership um, that this is something that is working and it doesn't increase liability. It's actually reducing drownings and we can see the successes on Kauai with the data. And that's what we're looking for is actually seeing the data impacted. Thank you. Uh, next question from the auditorium, if any. Okay, I have a pathophysiology question, perhaps. Um, so I think when we talk about immediate action for the drowning victims, I know high flow oxygen is preferred. However, a lot of the school campuses don't wanna have oxygen canisters on campus because they're a liability and may explode. Um, so I know the rapid O2 was shown on the screen. And from what I remember, that one is six liters for 15 minutes. So when we kind of talk about stratification, I would assume that the six liters is better than nothing, but high flow would still be preferred if the lifeguard has the higher flow canisters. I don't have specific data on that, but just knowing what we know, I would say any oxygen is better than no oxygen um, so that we can prevent uh, apnea and also um, try to decrease the anoxic injuries that occur. So I would think that that's very reasonable that what's, you know, you have to use your resources that are available. So if you're the only one there, you're comfortable giving rescue breaths, that's where you're at. If there is lifeguard station, they do have a tank with high flow capabilities. I would go with that if they have a bag max device as well. But if there's only the six liter capabilities, we use what we can until we get more help around us. And I don't know if anybody knows about the Rapid O2. It's kind of like an AED for oxygen. So it's no prescription, six liters for 15 minutes. Um, so for some of the field trips that on neighbor island are farther away from medical facilities, some of the schools are having the lifeguards have these on board as well. And it's pretty simple to use. You actually just pop it open there's a mask that comes with it that you just put on the victim and then um, you can get them oxygen pretty quickly. Right. Um, go ahead with the other questions and don't throw it. No questions. All right, if there's no more questions, we'll be here to answer any questions for anybody who's here today. Um, uh, also, as had been seen, um, we had put up our contact information and we mean that. Um, we're here as resources. Um, we all have different roles. We all have different skill sets and, and abilities to answer different questions, but we'll get you to the right place and the right person. Um, so certainly do not hesitate to contact us. If you're interested in getting involved, we've given you a lot of different ways, but if you have your own way, we'd love to hear that as well. Um, we're looking for partnerships. We're looking to spread the word. Um, we're looking to make a difference. Um, it's obviously a very important issue. Uh, and so, like I said, we'll, we'll stay here today to answer any other questions, but we'll, we'll leave it at this. And, and again, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much for having us today. And thank you for allowing us to speak on this topic. Hey, thanks all the speakers. Thank you all who attended today. Have a safe rest of the week. Take care. Good